was that was a fantastic um, piece, Andy. Just just bringing all those issues to get together for us. I think you would have enjoyed uh, Danny Dorling's presentation this morning. I think echoed. I think you're you're offering some of the answers to with the problems he was sharing about housing being a human right and and as you said, edging us towards perhaps a universal basic income or that kind of approach. Um, I'd, as chair's privilege, a particular question. I mean, I, I really liked your optimism, but but we we saw the wit, the minister this morning. How optimistic are you really about what's going to happen next? Because Danny Dawling's numbers about the numbers of families, for example, living in the private rented sector without enough money to pay the rent, um, the numbers of families on the edge of drifting into homelessness is it must be a deep concern. And perhaps a second question as a as a the mayor of greater manchester as a regional leader what would you what would you like the government to do for you for the city region to help you I mean, it sounds like to me they could help quite a bit by kind of putting some money in and getting out of the way for you to, to organize and to lead but is there anything else missing thinking about the health system perhaps oh my god there's so, <laughs> so, exactly so, so there's so much missing it's like where do i where do i where do i start but just to sort of agree with you. I, I do worry a lot about what, what's coming after the pandemic, definitely. Um, I think there's a mental health crisis that's been happening largely hidden, well, not completely hidden, but, you know, I think it's, it's there's a pandemic of, uh, of mental, uh, mental uh, illness, I think, um, mm. going to come, come through more and more. Um, and, yeah, I worry, I worry greatly about what's, um, what's around the corner. But I suppose you do have to hold on to the positives. We know what works. If you want to stop homelessness, if that's a genuine government commitment, I'm going to give them the benefit of the doubt here because I think they have done some good things as a, a government um, on homelessness. They, they More recently, I think, it's fair to say, have seen to understand more the, uh, the, the importance of the issue. Um, I think the minister, I, although I don't know him, I, I understand he has some background in the issue, which is encouraging. Um, so I think we know what... We know what will work, basically. We've got three pilots of Housing First in Liverpool, West Mids and Manchester that show it works. Mm. They're all recording similar rates of success when you have a high fidelity model um, to the principles of Housing First. So it's a question of will, isn't it? It's a yeah. question of will. And I, and I, you know, this is something I've been musing about with the nurses' pay situation over the last few days. For a long time... You know, ministers have got on the telly, and this was true in the government I was in, saying, oh, it's not affordable. It's not affordable. But I think things have changed in the last year as to what is affordable and what isn't affordable. Lots of things are suddenly affordable, aren't they? That, mm. you know, and it depends you know, whether you think tackling homelessness is, you know, it's affordable. If you choose to do it as a priority, it's definitely affordable. In terms of the powers that I would want, I would like the powers to reform the private rented sector in Greater Manchester. I would like um, statutory powers of regulation uh, underpinning a, a good landlord charter. I think many get away with murder in terms of the um, uh, poor well, failure to invest in their properties, leaving them as places that damage health, as, as I've said, damaging. And, and you know, they also then have the situation of being able to evict people fast track. You know, that, that, that isn't uh, right at all. I think we need to have powers over reforming the private rented sector, greater control then over housing benefit. So mm. only giving it to those good landlords, not allowing bad landlords to be in receipt of, of housing benefit. I think we need to be freed up with the finances to build homes for social rent. Um, there has been some good work from the government, the Rough Sleepers Accommodation Programme. We're very enthusiastic about that, but it's not at the scale that will solve the problem. Um, so, uh, yeah, I mean, I, there, there are obvious things, the powers they could give us, and we could we could do it. Finland, if you look at Finland's figures, when they did make Housing First a national priority, they are the only country between 2010 and 2020 that saw levels of rough sleeping and homelessness coming down the other way. Nearly every other Western country, it was going, it was going yeah. up. Finland brought it down because of national political will um, behind, uh, behind a drive. It can be done. The question is, are we prepared to do it? And your answer to that? <laughs> I don't know. I doubt it, if I'm honest. We are in Greater Manchester. I can tell you that now. For, well, if I'm, you know, I'm standing for election at the moment, I can't <laughs> speak for 
you know, if it's not me, if, but if it's me re-elected, I absolutely will reaffirm the commitment to end rough sleeping. Um, I donate 15% of my salary to the Greater Manchester Mayor's Charity to support a bed every night. I will continue to do that every month if re-elected. We will uh, continue um, to, to do everything that we're, we're doing. We're going to bring forward our homelessness prevention strategy. Is the will there at the national level fully to get behind this? I don't know. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm kind of kind of thinking maybe not, but I, I don't know. But I think they, the government's got a choice. It's done some things that have worked. It's got some success stories here. It's whether they want to really turn it into a national success story. Because they, they can do. There's no reason why we can't do a Finland. Mm, yeah, yeah, I think you're right. Um, fascinating. Thank, thank you, Andy. Um, Gareth, Mandy, Jeff, can I, I can see you. I don't know whether the audience can. But if you wanted to come in and wave, wave at me, is there anything you wanted to do the can? So, so, yeah, you're all, you're all on, on screen. Um, um, any, yeah, I've got, yeah, I've got a few thoughts, but that's okay. Um, Andy, thank you so much for coming along today as well. And um, I had read like a bit about your background and stuff, and it's it's so refreshing to hear because that's just the way it is. And it's like before with Eddie Hughes, I think we should have you, Eddie Hughes, in the ABAs in a room, and we might get somewhere nationally. Do you know what I mean? It's it's that the housing first model is personal centered. That is the very core of it. No time scale, no nothing, all the support for people. And it's, you know, and don't, you know, like that when you when you said about ending homelessness, you couldn't have predicted that pandemic was going to come and change society so dramatically. You had the vision, you've got you, you've got the understanding, you know, it's just getting it out there, you know. So I really appreciate it. and like we could like go grilling you and saying this, that, or that, but there's nothing really because you're singing from this the same song sheet that I personally would like to see happen. Housing first across the board, integrated service. And do you know what I mean? We know how to get it done. It's just starting to make people believe it. So thank you for your time. Andy, have you ever worked with EBEs before? Experts by experience. And do you do it in Manchester? Like you've got a homeless board you go into afterwards? Well, would you consider a couple of EBEs, somebody from Greater Manchester to, to sit on that board with you? They're, they're, they're on it, Jeff. So we, we have, yeah, yeah, we've Fantastic. always, um, you know, we've adopted the principle of, um, you know, co, what of co-production, whatever, you know, whatever people, the buzzwords are, but no, always, you know, we, 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 um, we, we the Homelessness Action Network is just a, a fantastic forum, you know, it's just people with experience of, who work with, you know, it's, it's just people who are experts in many different ways and, I think it's the strength of our of our work. I would, Mandy, I wouldn't say we've got, you know, we're on a journey, if, is what I would say. And I'm not going to come on here and claim that, you know, we've got everything right and there's more we could clearly do in terms of building homes for social rent, et cetera. But I think we do now know, I think Greater Manchester has, has kind of now understood what is needed. And it's, it's as you said, if you, you've you got to start, the way I keep saying it to my, um, to, to my team, whenever I'm kind of um, talking to them about this, it's, you know, it's simple. It's names, not numbers. That is the approach that we adopt. Names, not numbers. People, the individual. Somebody from my office who leads my office, kind of when we were finding it hard to crack, we weren't getting anywhere to begin with. And he started to go out doing the walkabout, you know, every couple of weeks, getting the names of everybody and then going back to the public services saying, hang on a minute, you know this person because they're in touch with you and you, these people know them. So we joined the dots around these people. And we kept confronting our public services with the same names. Why, why has this person now not been given, you know, because it's often not just a home that they need. It might be mental health support. It's, and we made the public services have one conversation about each individual. And that was a massive part of our, of our journey. And Alex, I think this is why I support the faculty so much. The health service has a bigger role here mm -hmm. than it sometimes acknowledges itself. It, when I first said to the health service in Great Manchester, I want you to help fund the bed every night. They said, well, we don't fund shelters. And I said, well, why not? You know, I said, you fund obesity or you fund, you fund sort of all kinds of health drives. But you're going to leave my office here and you're going to walk past people whose health is visibly suffering in front of you in the street. And you're telling me the National Health Service has no responsibility to try and accommodate those people. And eventually that argument kind of wore them down a bit. And, they did, and to be fair, they do now contribute. The National Health Service in Great mm -hmm. does contribute. But it was a massive barrier to get mm. through. And mm. I think 
the journey here is all public services, if you can, buying into a names, not numbers approach, a recovery approach, uh, and then you can get somewhere. But thank you, Mandy, I really appreciate can, it. Can I, can I bring in a, a, thank the, you for that as well. the, the other theme which we talked about last night, we had a fabulous lecture from, from a UCL professor of community pediatrics, actually asking us to think more upstream, almost about prevention, and to think about the, the roots which lead individuals, families, children, into lives and into situations which perhaps end up with homelessness. And a particular call from her, it's Mandy's call very often for more integration of services and for, the, for thinking about families in temporary accommodation, families ending up in bed and breakfast, families ending up in that real bottom end of the private rented sector. Are you doing anything to think about that, that, how, how to head people off at the pass almost or to lift people up before they end up in, in that homeless position? This is a real learning point for me, uh, Alex, having left Westminster. So there's an obsession down there, isn't there, about the benefits bill and then, you know, particularly all that stuff that George Osborne brought along around, you know, shirkers and all of this kind of sort of, sort of mm. like trying to use the benefit system to, to label people. And what I have witnessed uh, now, and I didn't understand this fully a couple of years ago, is when they froze local housing allowance by being, quote, tough on benefits, which is what, you know, what the narrative was at national level. All that that does is it loads unfunded costs on local authorities. Mm -hmm. Then are seeing the, the, the presentations from, from homeless families. And if Mandy does go on about, I, I would say you're absolutely right, Mandy, to, to focus on temporary accommodation, because that is a hidden scandal, actually. Just because people aren't on the streets, it doesn't mean that children are not in really unsafe, uh, unsuitable uh, environments taken away from their school and their community and that that is actually a, a bit of a hidden scandal I think largely uh, Alex some of what goes on in really poor standard just because local authorities just don't have the money to pay for it because these are unfunded pressures that they have to pick up from caps on local local housing allowance and this is the kind of way that Westminster treats local government and it's you know I see it more clearly now than I did when I was part of that Westminster system and I would say, you know, if you, if you want some, something serious to be done about temporary accommodation, which it should be done, you can't do it on the basis on which local authorities are currently operating with their finances. They are always the last, the last public service to get support. And, um, you know, I'm afraid, you know, it's, they're really, really struggling. And, mm -hmm. you know, the government's going to, if it's serious, as I said before about homelessness, why so I gave you that sort of doubtful answer, it has to start shoring up um, financial base of our local authorities otherwise we, you know, we, we won't be able to give those um, uh, homeless families the, the, the correct support that they need. Mm. I think that's right and we're pleased we've got several of your fabulous colleagues from Greater Manchester talking on this theme actually in the session directly after this about um, how primary care can do, can do more to, 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 to find families, yeah. to find people in need of support before they fall into at the more serious end of the spectrum of homelessness. We're trying to develop a sort of commissioning framework for temporary accommodation. So it's, to kind of, you know, it's a sort of standards-free zone at the moment, isn't it? Well, I think the local authorities try, but it's not easy at all. Um, and what we need to do is get some clear principles about, and, and certainly some of the safeguarding issues within, within where there are kids in, in places where there are, you know, potentially people who could, could pose a risk to them. I mean, so, this stuff really needs looking at, in, in my mm. view, and we're that, trying to develop a... That's all. definitely a main issue about... Um where where you push where you push some people um because not all accommodation is suitable accommodation for certain people um like you said if children get put into certain hostels and there's drug users or there's i don't know ex-convicts or whatever who's been done for abusing children or whatever so, i mean they're in that environment they're in that and and they're exposed to all of that and it's the same as a, an addict off the streets. If you put an addict off the streets into a hotel or a hostel with other users and they're going through detox or they're going through a, um, rehabilitation, that's going to cause them to relapse. So I think a big issue there is realising that not all accommodation is suitable accommodation and getting that across the board and making people realise that as well. I think it's important. I think it's massively important, Gareth, and thanks for coming in on it. I mean, I, it goes back to what I was saying, though. If you start with a quality offer that, that sends a message about respect and dignity, then you, you're creating the conditions for that 
situation to succeed because people will you know feel valued don't they and, and it will be a good environment and it will help them recover their dignity and everything else that may have been taken from them if you put them in an environment that almost reinforces the message that no one gives one about them well you're creating the conditions for more and more failure aren't you if you if, if you do that and this is the the problem that we've got with the, with the mentality in our country around public spending we kind of we don't like doing the right thing in the first instance upstream and then we spend thousands of pounds downstream as crisis services try and pick up the pieces it's, it's, it makes no sense mm -hmm. one of the ways in which i got public buy-in in great Manchester to a bed every night was that i used the crisis research that showed that the cost of somebody left to sleep rough for a year is about £20,000 to public services. Whereas the cost of a bed every night, every night is £11,000 because it's about 30 something quid, you know, the way we managed to fund it. So which one should we do? You know, it's but, but public yep. services still work on the failure principle. Um, and I just, this is why I do support universal basic income. I think we would have a stronger society in this country if we gave everybody a secure home and a secure level of income, you're giving them the, the conditions for success then if you do that and, the, and mm. the conditions for their kids to be successful. If you have them living day to day in a poor quality private rented property where they're fearful of eviction, their mental health is just going to go down the pan, isn't it? And then you're going to create the conditions. We, we, we create the conditions for failure rather than creating the conditions for success. And, you know, that is very much evident in the conditions of temporary accommodation, which you've just described. Can I just say as well that um, because of like the pandemic that, that there's going to be a, so many more casualties as well. So if it's now that the government should be acting, it's all very well saying we've got numbers housed at the minute. That's not accommodation, do you know what I mean? That's not real. That's not a stable home for a person. But it needs to be now because, like you said, the mental health issues going on now, do you know what I mean? The younger generation, this, you know what I mean? The social skills and everything's been took away from them. The, the aftermath is going to be horrific, do you know? And the numbers will go up and up. So if now, if there's ever a time to stop putting things like you're suggesting, you know, it's now. You know what I think we should do, uh, Man Damon? Mm -hmm. you know, the government should keep the universal credit uplift indefinitely um, to, to pick up the, the warning that you're rightly pointing to. Mm -hmm. They should um, wipe away people's rent arrears because obviously there's a massive increase in people in rent arrears. And I think they should, because it's no fault mm -hmm. of people, is it? The pandemic has taken their work uh, away from them. And I think they should extend the eviction ban. And if there are, if there are examples of landlords who've really lost out unfairly, well, then they should compensate those landlords. But I think if they did those three things, universal credit, wipe away people's arrears, extend the eviction ban, immediately you'd have create, you've created a, a platform of stability so people can stop worrying about it. Whereas if you don't do those things, people worry, and the worry creates mental health, addiction issues, failure issues. You know, mm -hmm. and, and that's, I, I, my fear is we'll, we'll, we'll tip back into yeah. that cycle post-pandemic, unfortunately. Yeah. Hopefully not. Hopefully things Hopefully not. Hopefully yeah. Eddie will sort it out. Always hope. Oh. And my fear is that we're running into people's lunch and into your next meeting, Andy, because <laughs> we, we've we've taken more of your time than you had promised. But thank you very, very much for joining us this morning. Well, this afternoon now. I think I think I've been speaking that long, Alex. <laughs> <laughs> I think everyone on in our audience would have agreed with, with those last points you made about some some practical actions the government could take now. To defend people from what's coming, because I, I I agree that I mean, we've seen the pandemic, but we've not yet seen the real aftermath begin to come out, have we? And how that's going to unfold in the next months and years is is something which certainly we worry about. But I think it's scary. And, but I think the government could take measures, as you say, to head it off at the pass and protect a lot of people from from what might be coming at us. Um, but I'm afraid I, I do have to bring us to a close. I've got voices in my ear saying we're. We're timing out. Um, we have our next session at, at 1.30, where, as I said, we've got GPs from Greater Manchester talking about how to tackle health inequalities. So, so thank you for your support to them. Um, 
And we've got colleagues from Hull talking about integrated commissioning across the city of Hull. Um, again, some really interesting lessons learned there during COVID. Um, but to bring this session to a close, thanks to you, Andy, for joining us. Um, thanks to Gareth, Jeff and Mandy for, for that discussion. Um, I'm going to call this session to a close and see you on a screen later today and see you in Manchester one day for real, Andy, I hope. Thanks, Thank guys. You. Thank you. Cheers, Andy.